Have you ever noticed that some compression products work better than others? Or maybe one compression product worked really well for one patient, but when you went to repeat the same product and the same technique on a different patient, it just didn't work as well. Well, don't worry, you're not alone. And one thing I've concluded is that compression definitely matters. And in today's final segment of lymphedema of the lower extremities, our topic of discussion is compression. Have you ever felt like this before? Confused about what compression to put on a patient? Like there's so many products to choose from out there, but you don't know which one will be the best for your patients? When I first started treating lymphedema 15 years ago, it was almost easier to choose compression for a patient because they were far less choices. Now, I'm not saying they were all good choices back then, but it was all we had and you learned to work with what you had. Now, today, we have so many options that we forget about what all of our options are, and even more, we don't understand what all our options mean. So let's break down the details of compression and try to understand what characteristics of compression are needed for success and when various types of compression may be more appropriate for certain diagnoses. The first thing we need to look at when assessing compression is what type of compression we are using. There are two categories of compression. One is elastic and the other is inelastic. So let's start with looking at elastic compression. This is generally what most people understand as compression in the medical world. An example would be an ACE wrap, which are still pretty commonly used for compression. The properties of elastic compression are going to consist of a lot of stretching materials. So think of a rubber band stretching, or think of when you pull an ACE wrap. The material is not stiff and it tends to stretch more than 100% of its retching position, and in some cases, far, far more than that. When pressure is applied against tissue with a material that has a lot of stretch in it, it is known as static compression. The reason it's called static compression When pressure is applied against tissue with a material that has a lot of stretch to it, it's known as static compression. The reason it's called static is because the variables in compression, or the pressures, don't really change very much when movement occurs. In other words, if we wrap a limb with an elastic bandage and it is applying approximately 10 millimeters of mercury compression at rest, what will that pressure be when you go to move or muscle contract? Well, most likely the pressure will not change much because when you move your muscles, the elastic fibers simply just move with the muscle during contraction. Because there's no major change in pressure, we call this static compression. Furthermore, let's look at this from another angle. If I'm wearing elastic compression and I have pulled my bandage tightly against the skin, what are those elastic fibers doing at rest? Well, the natural property of elastic is to recoil back to its original state. And thus, if this is the case on the tissue, then this will result in high amount of pressure when the limb is at rest. Now let's compare it to inelastic compression. So now we have a product that does not have elastic in it. So what does that mean? First off, if there's no elastic, then there should be minimal to no recoil. Also, if the product is absent of elastic, then we can know that it won't stretch much and will be very stiff. Bandages and products that are inelastic generally stretch less than 100%. In fact, the short stretch bandage used for lymphedema wrapping are generally a 25% stretch material, so not very much at all. So now let's picture an inelastic bandage on a limb and conceptualize what will occur through movement. If we apply an elastic bandage, it will generally be applied at full stretch. It sounds like it would be too much to apply something at full stretch, but let's remember there's no elastic in this bandage, so what is actually happening that makes this okay? Well, first of all, there is very minimal, if at all, recoil, and therefore the pressure at rest should really be very minimal. However, on the flip side to that, 
what's going to happen when we have muscle contraction? Well, all of a sudden, there is not elastic and the bandage was applied with full stretch, so as soon as the muscle contracts, there is resistance in the compression and in turn, we see a huge spike in pressure, but only when contracting. As soon as contraction is over, the resistance pressure is diminished and the resting pressure returns to minimal. This is what we call dynamic compression because we have drastic changes in pressure with muscle contraction and this type of mechanism is what's most effective with the venous and lymphatic return. It is through muscle contraction of the calf muscle that promotes the return of blood and lymph and it is only with dynamic compression that we will see this mechanism better supported, especially in the presence of venous and lymphatic malfunction. Now you just heard me make mention of pressure from compression at rest and this is referred to as resting pressure. And the true definition of resting pressure is the force that is exerted from the outside toward the tissue when the muscle is at rest. In other words, what kind of pressure is the material or fabric or bandage or garment or whatever you're using applying to the tissue when the muscle is at rest? If it is an elastic product, the answer is a lot. If you're using an inelastic product, then the answer is minimal. Now let's look at another kind of pressure, working pressure. This pressure has to do with what's happening inside the tissue as it reacts to the outside force exerted against it, or as it reacts to resistance from the fabric. Well, once again, if we have elastic material on the skin, this pressure is going to be minimal, and with an inelastic material, the pressure should be high. So to recap all this, we have two pressures we're interested in facilitating appropriately, resting pressure and working pressure. And ideally, the best way to support the calf muscle mechanism to drive the return of blood and lymph is through low resting pressures and high working pressures. Therefore, the best type of compression to use would be short stretch inelastic compression. Not only is this type of compression going to provide the best support of the body's natural muscle pumping mechanism, but it is also a safe way to compress in the presence of arterial disease because the resting pressure is low, therefore avoiding further restriction of blood flow if compression is needed. So let's look at this in terms of products and also take this opportunity to introduce you to a new term we call wall stability. Wall stability is an additional factor to consider when choosing compression. And the best way I like to explain is through a very silly analogy. Yeah, here we go. I want you to picture two walls. Let's pretend both of those walls are dams. And those dams are going to be containing water. Currently, there is no water coming to the dams, but the water is on its way. And we've got two different walls. One of these walls is going to be made out of rubber bands. The other wall is going to be made out of concrete. And the amount of pressure needed to combat the water that's coming is 30 to 40 millimeters of mercury compression. And both these walls are going to provide 30 to 40. But when that water comes, and I want you to picture that water coming, which wall actually going to hold better. Both of them are applying the same amount of compression, but one of these walls is going to hold the water better and contain it better. Obviously, the wall with concrete. So I want you to kind of relate this to wall stability. Obviously, we don't have compression socks made of concrete, thank goodness, but you get the point. It's, it's one thing to have the right dosage of compression, 30 to 40 is enough contain, to contain that water, but we also need something stronger than rubber bands or something stronger to contain that water. And that would depend on whatever fabric you're choosing. And in this picture here, we've got 
different products listed. And they are in order of what is the least, what has the least amount of wall stability all the way up to what has the most wall stability, starting with an ace wrap. An ace wrap is super stretchy, has a lot of elasticity in it, and therefore, even if applied with 30 to 40, it's still not going to have much wall stability to it. Circular knit garments are also elastic, and they are not going to have as much wall stability either. And then as we move up, we have two-layer wraps. A lot of people understand two-layer wraps um, in the wound care world. Those have more wall stability. Um, and then up to short stretch, lymphedema wraps and circade, those two are actually on the same level. But we're talking about inelastic short stretch compression, and they also have high wall stability as well. So they provide good amounts of compression, but when it comes to actually containing edema, think about your stage twos and threes of lymphedema. We, we don't just need a dosage of compression for that. We also need a thick wall to contain that and or reduce that. Here's a different view on how to look at compression in terms of resting pressure and working pressure. Notice the the light blue color would be resting pressure, and the gray is going to be working pressure. And you can see when looking at resting pressure what the short stretch and the circade are providing. They're providing a low resting pressure. When you move into ace wrap and circular knit, you're looking at a high resting pressure. And flat knit is kind of a nice in-between. In the, in the back, we look at working pressure, and you can see what is short stretch and circuit providing? They're providing good working pressure. And ace wraps and circular knit are providing a low working pressure. And then again, flat knit being right there in the middle. I'd like to switch gears here at this junction and really cross compare bandaging to adjustable Velcro compression. First, I'd like to start by looking at bandaging. The patient pictured in this image has amazing results. Results that were achieved through short stretch, multi-layer bandaging. So in a nutshell, I'm a fan of bandaging. It works, it works really well. I've spent many years of my life bandaging and I enjoy it. There's no doubt about patients have made tremendous progress with multi-layer compression bandaging. But bandaging isn't without its flaws. Bandaging is very tedious and time consuming. It enables dependence on the therapist to drive reduction in results. And hygiene is always an issue between treatments, right? Because if your patient wants to take a shower between treatments and we're telling them that they've got to stay in their compression bandages, then hygiene is going to be an issue for that patient. The other thing is that bandaging requires a high visit frequency to obtain reduction and keep compression consistent. And in this day and age, those visits are pretty much no longer available like they once were. Medicare goes in and out of their therapy caps. Insurance companies mandate number of visits. Many patients have to work while undergoing CDT and can't attend a high visit frequency. And other patients have transportation issues that prevent them from attending regularly. It seems like there's always an issue that's preventing us from being able to follow our original protocol of at least four times a week therapy, recommended five times a week visit frequency. Whatever the case may be, therapy visits for CDT are averaging two times a week at the most three times a week in most places now. So even though bandaging works, the struggles to keep the needed frequency for bandaging are getting in the way. Now I'd like to discuss circade products specifically the reduction kit. There's a specific approach that I was able to bring into my lymphedema therapy that wasn't always there before. And that approach is called adjustability. First of all, many people have mistaken the circuit reduction kit as a maintenance tool. And just to clarify, this is not a maintenance product. It is a treatment product intended for phase one of CDT and is an alternative to short stretch multilayer bandaging. 
then the big advantage of the reduction kit, as I have already mentioned, is adjustability. Having the ability to adjust compression as swelling reduces allows for consistent compression to stay in place between treatments, potentially speeding up the reduction time to the equivalent of daily treatment, but without the patient needing to attend treatment daily. This is especially effective for patients who are only able to attend treatment two times a week, or maybe even one time a week. Another factor about the reduction kit that I like to discuss is the control it brings to many patients. So often our patients rely on us to reduce the swelling, and then we hand the reins over to them after our part is done and expect them to maintain the work that we've accomplished. If we can involve the patient in the reduction phase of treatment and teach our patients how to reduce their own swelling, we are empowering them to be successful with any future setbacks that could come their way or be setting them up for excellent long-term success in their lifelong journey to manage their lymphedema. The other thing you're going to notice as clinicians is the time savings. It takes at least 30 minutes of time to complete bandaging. Between taking them off and re-rolling them and then reapplying them, a lot of your treatment time is, is taken up right there. If you're in wound care, cutting off compression wraps and reapplying new ones still takes just as long. The circuit products, once you have fabricated the garment on the first treatment, the time it takes to remove and reapply compression thereafter is a fraction of the time of bandaging. Therefore, more time for treatment or more time for wound care. When you think about bandaging, think about what that compression is doing in the first 24 hours. Hopefully it's doing a lot. Should be. Typically you should see a reduction and the swelling should be starting to go down. But what happens after that 24 hour period is over and the patient is not returning to treatment for another day or two? The compression becomes less effective and refill can even take place if bandages do not stay in place. For this reason, adjustability has the potential to reduce swelling at the original intended pace of CBT at five times a week. If the patient is not able to complete it themselves, this is much easier alternative for a spouse or caregiver to do versus bandaging. We talked a lot about comorbidities that often present with lymphedema, specifically heart failure, kidney failure, and arterial disease. And it can be pretty difficult to treat when you've got that, when you've got those comorbidities combined with lymphedema. Adjustability can be a great feature for treating patients with these comorbidities. To be able to set to the tolerability level when you're treating heart failure or when you're treating arterial disease can be a much safer option. A person with PAD will be able to loosen the compression to a level that is tolerable instead of removing it or cutting the bandage off in the case that it was applied too tightly. A patient with heart failure will be able to loosen the compression or remove the compression at night for bed and reapply the next morning so they can safely have a good night's sleep without worrying about compression being applied during the night hours. When it comes to wound care, accurate dosage can be paramount in making sure you have the right amount of compression in place to apply for the vein disease while compensating for any arterial disease that is present. If the venous system is able to receive the proper dosage of compression consistently and between visits, wound healing can be expedited considerably. Also, Don and Doffing is made simple for patients who needing to manage their swelling independently after the wound is healed. Finally, it is all about doing whatever we can to improve the quality of life for our patients. If there's a tool out there that simplifies the process and brings success to a patient, then consider offering it as an option to your patient. At the end of the day, what matters most is that your patient be able to have a good quality of life while living with lymphedema. I like to say that the patient should run the lymphedema. The lymphedema should not run the patient. Thank you so much for listening with us. We truly do want to help your patients feel better. So please reach out to any of us if there are any more ways we can assist you in this endeavor.